Hi. Today, we're going to talk about agoraphobia. Why? Well, it's been coming up a lot in my life. Because, again, I have that too. Who would have thought, right? But, one, you know, people that work aren't going to ask me, like, what does that mean? Guess it's not a term that people usually hear a lot. And, you know, everybody on the internet hates me because they don't get what it is. So, why don't I explain it? Does agoraphobia mean that you can't leave your house at all? No. It doesn't mean that. It means something different. And unfortunately, when it goes untreated, you end up to the point where you can't leave your house. So, so yes, it's an anxiety disorder. It comes from there. But it also has an actual real thing. And agoraphobia itself isn't that common. It only occurs in about like less than 2% of the population. And for some weird reason, women are twice as much affected by it than men. And I'm not gonna go in like some weird reason actually. There there are some studies, but they're, they're theories. And the theories are just like socioeconomic things about men have more freedom than women, you know, did whatever, I don't know. The fact is that mostly it affects women more than it affects men. However, how, how, do, how does one like get agoraphobia, right? Genetics and environment. Just like my BPD, just like my borderline personality disorder, same thing. I had to be born predisposition, which I did. I was born with ADHD. And then there's childhood trauma, PTSD. All those things together create this effect of agoraphobia. And agoraphobia is defined as a phobic disorder. Yes, it's a phobia. It is all in my head. I know that though. However, it's still tough. And it's a specific anxiety about being in a place or a situation where escaping would be difficult or impossible or maybe extremely embarrassing, depending on the person. Or, and this is the big one, that where you are in that situation, help might not be available if anything were to happen. So that's where agoraphobia is. It's not necessarily not leaving your house. It's that you're afraid of where you're going, where you're gonna be, your ending or whatever, that if something happens, what the heck are you gonna do? Can somebody get to me? Can somebody save me? Can I save myself? At, that's where it comes, but then again, it's a phobia, which means that they are irrational fears. Goes back to the OCD. And yes, agoraphobia does come from OCD and PTSD kind of mushed in together, but we'll get that to later. So before I knew that I had agoraphobia, because for a while, I was in a home. I didn't necessarily know all my diagnosis. I just knew how life was hard in my head. So then, back then, before anybody was, I would explain to people that it was like being afraid of small spaces like a closet, but also being afraid of wide open spaces like a cornfield at the exact same time. And that's the best way that I can even describe it to this day. You're afraid of being stuck, but you're afraid because everything's big. Doesn't make sense to most people, I know. And logically, it doesn't make sense to me either. However, the fear is still there. And then a bunch of you are kind of like, well, you, you leave your house, you, you go to work, you, mm -hmm, yeah. That's the therapy. So the therapy for agoraphobia is CBT, so Cognitive Behavior Therapy, which I've had for eons, but it also includes exposure therapy, which means you go out there and you do it. That's what exposure therapy is. 
thankfully, you know, that's why I have a support worker that's there with me. Because, again, not everybody that has agoraphobia stays in locked in their house. But they will go to great lengths. And when I say great lengths, I mean great lengths. To avoid certain situations that will trigger this fear, this irrational fear, whether they know it's irrational or not, because not everybody is diagnosed and everybody has therapy. And then if you're at that point where, you know, you go to great lengths to avoid certain situation and you don't get help for it, that's when it eventually becomes to the point that you don't leave your house. Now, unfortunately, I was at that point. I didn't leave my house and I didn't talk. I mean, I kind of I kind of said words, but I didn't chat about stuff. Think about that. That's how far I've come in my journey. This is why I'm putting it out there. I'm talking to people because you can recover. Back in, I don't know what year it was, like 2003 or four or something like that. I was in a home and they helped me so much because the agoraphobia, the anxiety that was going on so bad, I didn't talk. My mother called me a bump on a log. I existed. I was there. I didn't have an opinion. Okay. This preface here didn't have an opinion. I didn't care. I ate what they put in front of me. I wore what they told me to wear. I, I was like a robot. You know, I could say yes or no and whatnot, but that was it. And then I learned. We did the exposure therapy. And at first it was really them standing outside the door, watching me walk to the corner where the stop sign was and back on my own. And then it was walk to the next block and the next block. And it took me two years, okay? It didn't happen overnight. And even to this day, there's still things I'm scared of. So I got a little bit better and then some of it kind of kicked back in because of why people develop agoraphobia and others don't. So like I said, again, there's genetic factors and there's environmental factors. So again, I had the anxiety and the predisposition and I had the childhood trauma you can check out my video on borderline personality disorder and you can check out the one on OCD as well because they're kind of like those two things smushed together kind of give you agoraphobia, I guess. But it also has to do with like trauma in general and some sort of, well, sometimes, I guess. But in my case, that's what it is, like abandonment issues. Now, I don't want to throw my ex under the bus, but that's what it was. So the first, you know, it was my first relationship with a guy. I realized, you know, whatever. I don't care about gender, whatever. Not the point. The fact that he was a guy wasn't the problem. The fact of who he was made it difficult because he didn't really care about me. And it took me a while to figure that out. And I'm sorry out there, you know, if anybody knows him. So the abandonment factor and the fact that I was told to my face that he didn't care that I had a panic attack. And I was also going through the narcolepsy that I gave myself from panicking too much. And, you know, at the time I had a car and he wanted to be driven everywhere. And even though I would tell him, like, look, I'm freaking out. And we didn't know that it was the narcolepsy at the time, but it, it was a weird thing. Okay? My brain's asleep through... REM sleep mode, but I'm still awake. I'll do a whole other thing on that later. But at the time, it feels like I'm high and it's just horrible. But he would still be like, no, no, like forcing me. Okay, not against my will, but you know, I, I wanted to make him happy. I wanted to be a good girlfriend, so I would drive him places. So yeah, that is what kind of brought it out. I was not necessarily always agoraphobic. I was for a while, and then I got better, and then it came back. So agoraphobia, I mean, can happen intermittently in, in life, and it's only a diagnosis if it's for six months of your life or more. Because you can have it for like a few months or whatever, depending on 
different factors of your life. Um, sometimes it usually happens like when a love, like a close loved one that takes care of you passes away because abandonment issues are another really big factor for agoraphobia. So I'm really sorry that I'm making my ex sound like um, a bad person. Uh, is I don't nec I don't think he's a bad person. I just think he has you know his own set of things he doesn't want to deal with. But in the case of our relationship. It pushed me that far and it messed me up. That was life. Building block. I learned from there. We're going to move on. So, yeah. That's why I go out. That's why I have a worker. I'm, I'm pushing myself. I don't want to be stuck in this house for the rest of my life. The same reason why I don't ever want to be monetized. I don't want YouTube stuff to be my job. So yeah, I know there's not a lot of likes and all that kind of whatnot. I'll reiterate that again. This isn't about public likes and public whatever. I mean, you want to like and subscribe or whatever. I don't care. It doesn't chat. It doesn't change anything to me. I can see the analytics part of who looks and how much traffic is there. And so does Google because they give me credits. <laughs> so whatever. And part of, you know, the Facebook page, okay, this YouTube supports the Facebook page and the page is it works because of the anonymity You know, I don't tell that's the whole point. Okay But getting back to the thing is that no, I don't wanted this to be my career I mean, I don't really do much other in my life. So I have time to do this and you know my actual part-time job but my part-time job again, I can go there and I'm completely myself I've worked there for a year and a half now. I'm very comfortable in the building. I'm comfortable with the people that are around me. Most of the staff are aware and they respect it. You know, they don't push my buttons. They get it, you know. So for me, my place of employment, my work, feels just as much as a safe space as my house does. And that's good. And I need to keep that. I need to have reasons to leave my house because the more that I, you know, do things or I don't leave, the more it's just going to make things worse. Because again, the only treatment is exposure. It's going out there and doing it. And that's what I do on the days where, you know, I don't have anything to buy. Even when I do actually need to go grocery shopping, I go to Costco, I go to Trinity, you know, I, there's a lot of people I know. I know there's a chance for panic attacks because that's another thing with agoraphobia is that when you put yourself in those situations you're afraid of, you usually end up with a panic attack. But I have to do those panic attacks to learn that I'm not going to die from a panic attack. And sometimes I don't have a panic attack at all. And I come home and all my body parts are here. I've got all my toes and all my fingers, both my ears, you know, I'm okay. And those are the things that I build on. Because that irrational fear, again, it's an irrational fear. It's a fear that I have in my mind that the logic part of my brain knows makes no sense. But because of the fact that there's a mental illness playing around in there, it still pushes that fear to the front anyway, no matter what. So I have to live the experiences and pretty much tell that part of my brain, look, I went to the store last week, nothing happened. I went to the store the week before, nothing happened. Nothing will happen this week. And you just keep going and you keep going. And that's it. So in a nutshell, that's agoraphobia. Not necessarily not wanting to leave your house. It's that you're afraid of the situation that you're you know, going to be going to. You don't have a way to escape if something happens. You don't necessarily have you don't know how you're going to get help if something happens because it is tied into, I think it's called trachophobia. Look that, I'm not sure. Because that's another phobia where you're just afraid to die. So this thing that I accidentally discovered while doing research on this, because even though I'm living it and I know it, I still wanted to, you know, research and look it up. I figured something out that might explain why I personally developed agoraphobia other than just staying at an anxiety disorder. So they, 
as in researchers. And when I mean researchers, I mean like when you get a PhD, okay, you have to write a dissertation or a thesis. I don't know which one of the two it is. Either way, you have to prove something. And it takes years. It's not something that happens overnight. And again, it's researchers. So most of these theories, when I say they, I mean the researchers. And I mean medical students or some people going for PhDs in, you know, some kind of psychology or whatever. From like Harvard, Yale, Oxford. Those big places that have really good reputations. And also other places, okay, because actually the University of Calgary is having a lot of medical research breakthroughs these days. So go Canada on that one. However, what they've realized is that there's a link between people who have developed agoraphobia and people that have spatial vision problems. Hello, that's me. It's always been me. So one... I joke about the fact that I have no time-space continuum. That's just what I call it. And it's always been that way. I don't know distances. I don't know time. I have no sense of time. And that was one of the things that always made me so impatient. Because five minutes feels like half an hour to me. There's no difference between an hour, two hours, five hours. To me, in my brain, it takes the exact amount of time. I know. None of you get it because most of you can. I have no idea what day of the week or month or whatever we are. I have no clue that doesn't naturally come with me. Most of the people can look outside and, you know, by how high the sun is or whatever, they can kind of guess that they're close to supper time or what. That stuff doesn't register. And it's most probably because I have high-functioning autism, which we've only recently figured out, but not the point. However, I've always known that I had no recollection of space or, or whatever. And my dad figured that out quite early because, you know, I would try to tell stories about how far something was. And I'd be like, he's like 50 feet in the ditch, mom. And my dad was like, no, no, he was like 250 feet in the ditch. And I was like, what? And when I went with 50, like, I, I thought that was a big number. Like, I would make up a big number. <laughs> anyway, so my point is, is that I've never had a spatial ability. I don't have any. Mostly when I go downstairs, I don't have it. And from what I've heard when my family did talk to me, is that it is a family trait on my mother's side. Apparently none of my aunts and even one of my cousins on my, my mom's side of the family, they don't have spatial ability for like distance when we go downstairs. We all have a problem with that. So that's a thing. I have a spatial thing. Also, I'm going blind progressively and they don't know why what we do know so far is that in this eye i have a really bad astigmatism even with glasses on so if i take my glasses off with this eye i need to be about here to see clearly with this eye i need to be here to see clearly from far away however even with my glasses on, I need to be about here from far away to read clearly close up. Now, to be nearsighted and farsighted at the same time can't happen. Because that has to do with the shape of your eye. And your eye can't be two shapes at the same time. And you can as an older person because that has to do with like age and something I don't really know about. But... As someone who's my age, both of them can't happen at the same time. So I had to go to an ophthalmologist to figure this out, and he did. So what he explained is that exactly that. On this eye, I, my astigmatism is so bad, which is the shape of my cornea, that between here and here, I can't see. Because I need, you know, the vision correction for far away to close up doesn't happen in there. The way to fix it I mean, there is one, but it's super expensive, and unfortunately, you know, social development won't pay for it. And even if I had private insurance, I'm pretty sure they wouldn't either. It's a hard contact lens. And that's how contact lenses used to be, by the way. Sorry, I have alarms to remind me to take medication. Because 
Again, ADD kicks in. I need to take meds. I wake up in the morning and take amphetamines. Not fun. Not fun. And then they kind of wear off about 4 o'clock. So then I take another one at 4 o'clock. They keep me going because if not, I'll crash. And... Not fun. However, have they helped? Yes. And the amphetamines help on two things. One, they help with the ADHD. But they also help curve off the narcolepsy. So, I'm going to put up with it. Yeah. I'm kind of used to the effects now, but when I first started, I don't understand why people do meth. I don't. Because methamphetamine is the stuff that people cook up in their backyard to try to recreate amphetamines. And I didn't like it. Maybe I'm weird. I don't know. I don't want it. Either way, my point is that I have agoraphobia because I have an anxiety disorder and I have all sorts of other things that happened in life. And it might also be because I'm going blind and nobody knows why. They've looked. They've tried. We just got to roll with it. I have agoraphobia. I have anxiety. I have all that stuff. I go out into the world and practice anyway because I do not want to be a prisoner. I don't want to be a prisoner in my mind. I don't want to be a prisoner in my home. And that should go for everything with mental illness. Don't let it imprison your mind. Because it will. If you don't do anything, if you don't push. And pushing through it is hard and it's difficult. Trust me. It really, really is. But find that person that can support you. Either it can be a family member. In my case, it wasn't a family member. It was, you know, community, whatever. Doesn't matter. They'll help you. Find the help. If you don't know where that help is, again, that's why I'm here. The whole anonymity part. Okay, I said that wrong. The whole anonymity part. Yeah, whatever. I can't say that word. Not the point. Message me. You know, I can give you some pointers on who to... I don't know. I've been there. I've done it. I'm still working on it. And guess what? Mental health recovery is a lifelong process. I'm never going to stop pushing and pushing because the moment that I stop pushing and that I stop trying is the moment that it's going to take over and that I'm just going to go back into this little ball in the corner and be scared crapless. And I don't want that. So everybody, thank you for listening. I hope it cleared a few things up about why, you know, I can go out, I can do some things. They're not easy. I do them anyway. And why I choose to do them anyway. And again, if you recognize these in someone else or in yourself, please get them help or contact me. And, you know, I'll let you know if it is just, you know, a phase they're going through or if it's something you should be worried about and how to get the help and how to do things. That's what I'm here for. Help you. Give you advice. Now, I'm not an expert. I've just lived through it, which sort of kind of makes me a little bit of an expert. But I also have access to actual experts behind me who will help me. So, thanks. And keep trying. Don't give up. We love you. I love you. The world does. Be beautiful.